There are times in your life that you meet this person that actually walks their talk. <laughs> that, you know, since you hear about this person somehow, oh, she's doing this, and she's working with children, and she's working with elderly, and she's in the south part of the island, and all of a sudden she's someplace else. And this woman that we have here actually can move mountains. Can move people. I'm here because of her. She took us to Italy, and now she's taking us to someplace else. Not just physically, but emotionally too. So you know, it is really a true honor to be able to share with somebody that is real. So, ladies and gentlemen, Carmen Montana. <laughs> Thank you. I am more than honored to be presenting here because uh, since I came to Monroe for my first time, I knew this was part of my life. And it has transformed me in so many ways that as soon as I did my gateway, I said, I'm going to be a trainer. And when I became a trainer, and then you go out to the world, you can talk about the Monroe Institute when you go to a school, because if they go to the site of the Monroe Institute, it was you know, all about exploring consciousness. And then how do you present your work to the outside world so that it makes sense not to the people that come to Monroe Institute, because here we want to, everybody that comes here want to explore consciousness and a out of body experiences and all that. But then you're in the outside world and how do you present your work? And it has to be through sound. And this institute, why Monroe picked sound to get into altered state of consciousness where there are so many ways to do it. And that's what my talk is going to be about. And it's going to be about the exploration of consciousness and why Monroe is decided to use sound. It's going to be about sound vibration and creation, about sound applications, and about music, the universal language. If you go and find and research on these topics, there's billions of information about that, especially music. There is so much uh, information. I prepared a page uh, about sites that I have gone into the internet. In one part of my life when I started working as an outreach trainer, every month I would only do a day out of a month on internet research about what sound was about. And then you start reading books about it, and then you start looking for more information. And I think that Sound is what unites all the work when you become a professional division member. So what is the mission of the Monroe Institute? It's to advance the exploration of human consciousness and the experience of expanded states of awareness as a path to create, creating a life of personal freedom, meaning, insights, and happiness. When you start working with hemisync, as I did in, when I became a trainer, I realized personal freedom, yes, because you realize that you're more than your physical body. And that gives you a freedom. Like in Puerto Rico, once there was a, una huelga, how do you say, a strike about uni the university students. And they were, they were saying, you're afraid of us because we are not afraid. And when you're not afraid, then what can you do? Nobody can, can harm you. So the work of Monroe gives you the freedom that you're more than your physical body. And so maybe this is our dream. We're dreaming that we're here. And who are we? So that's a question. But we know that we're more than our physical body and that other realities exist. So it gives us that freedom. It gives meaning to your life because we're more than our physical body and, and then everything makes sense. 
and it gives you insights and it gives you happiness. And for me, sharing happiness in the world as a, a TMI a outreach trainer was having all the applications of Hemising throughout the world. I remember when I started doing my work, once a guy called me, have you done a Hemising with horses? And I said, oh, because he, he's in a, he works in the hippodrome where the horses race track. And how could you calm horses in the, when they start running, because they get very nervous. And I would call Shirley Blyley. Is there any research on horses? They had. And then I started working with autistic kids. And then there was the work of Susan uh, Morris, Susan Evans. There was uh, Robert Sorson's work, uh, Jacqueline Mast. And, and there was research about that. And then you would go to the world and give these parents tools that would provide happiness. And, and then the work had more meaning. I was once, a, I went to the uh, medical field and we did, we used hemisync in coma patients and it worked. And we used hemisync in cancer and it worked. And then my, my job going out to the world to get the Monroe work out had such an impact and a meaning on me and the many lives that I touch through my 17 years of work, it, it, it gave, uh, gave me another outlook and it helped me help so many people. And how did I help them? It was through sound. And so sound has a very important meaning in my life. And you can get into all these states of consciousness through all the things here, through fasting, through holotropic dreaming, uh, breathing, through hypnosis, through illness, through meditation, to transcendence, through Kundalini yoga, and we don't want to go to the near-death experience, right? Because we want to explore it in other ways. But then through sound, because drumming, binaural beats, there's so many ways, music, sound technology, toning, Chanting, all, also all those things, which is sound, gets you into altered states of consciousness. And why do we want to explore expanded states of awareness? Because then we, it gives us a meaning to our life. It, and it, uh, Tesla says, the day science begins to study non-physical uh, phenomena, it will make a progress in one decade than in all the previous centuries of its existence. And Nikola Tesla got all his information eh, from insights that he had. And many times those aha moments from, come from insights. So if we study physical phenomena, non-physical phenomena, we get much more information many times than by reading when you're right brain kicks in and gives you this wonderful insights. It's amazing. And if you want to find the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequencies, and vibration. And sound and magnetism are inextricably connected. And, in, and you, when you go into the internet, and at the end of my, on the afternoon, I will give you a, a sheet of paper with which has many of the uh, sites that I visited for this talk, books that you should uh, read, as I recommended reading, and also uh, organizations that use sound for many things. And that I will hand it to you later. All things in the universe are created and function through vibration, from the tiniest atom to a galaxy to the small cell of the body because whatever is uh, in the macro is in the micro. And everything that vibrates creates resonance, and that's what bonds us together. And sounds are governed by the rule of resonance. Okay. So I'm going to talk about sound, vibration, and creation, and I don't know if you're, and then I'm gonna show you a cymatic experiment. And if you have seen cymatic, it explains a lot. 
So let me go to this side. <laughs> and through Hinduism, Lord Vishnu was awakened by the sound of Om. And many of the traditions, the universe is formed by shanti, by singing. And when you sing, many times your your energy is transformed. It gives you happiness. It gives you, it it deals with your emotions. So singing, in terms of creation, is also very important. And and the Bible in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. And so you you see all this uh, different uh, religions how they talk about how sound affected creation. And in science, the Big Bang Theory, it's the Big Bang and the, mun the universe expanded. Uh, so this, uh, when I, when I, the first time I saw cymatics, I went like, wow, how sound affects us because it, it not only affects us uh, physically, which is gonna be shown there, but it affects our emotions, it affects our brains, it affects every part of the body. So. Alfred Tomatis use high frequencies to affect uh, the brain because he said it would energize it more. And we find that how the higher the frequencies, the more elaborated the patterns are. But in the book, The Power of Sound by Joshua Leeds, and I, had, I would advise you to read that book because it has so much information. Joshua Leeds says that Tomatis got all his uh, experiments done with high frequencies 
and he and he says that it would be have been very interesting if Tomatis and Monroe would have met because what he was doing with high frequencies, Monroe was doing with low frequencies. And uh, so, this person, Alexander Lauser Water, he, he uses a sound in water. And you can see there's four, a pat three patterns of flowers. And he would say the word, I don't know, it's in German, I don't know how to say it, but he would say flower, flower in a low frequency, and that was that. In a, and, and then in a higher frequency with his voice, and the flower patterns changed. So that was very amazing. And there's a saying that until you, when you name it, it appears. If it has not been named, it is not yet formed. So that's a very interesting thing. And Emoto's experiment, which I will talk a lot, a little bit about them, because I, I am a Hado instructor, which I work with Dr. Emoto. And when I went there, for me, that's why I'm so honored to be an outreach trainer. There was a, when I became a Hado trainer, there was a holy man in Emoto's work, a workshop and a, it, they're called a Dajari, and they're Buddhist monks that to become a Dajari, you have to be 10 days walking 42 kilometers praying without eating or drinking water. And when you decide to go into that journey, you die. So if you're not able to, to go through the whole thing, nobody's gonna help you and then you die. So there's few Dajaris in the world. and when we were presenting each other and the Dajari was there and I said I was from the Monroe Institute, the Dajari went over to me with a translator and said, the only place I want to visit in the United States is the Monroe Institute. Wow. Because all the things you do there. And I said, wow. So I got him as a gift uh, uh, in Japanese, a series of the gateway. So. <laughs> So now we're going to see Alexander Lauser's water work with uh, the working water. Alexander Lauterwasser is a photographer who makes captivating images of water under the influence of sound vibrations. As a child, Alexander raised tortoises at home in Heiligenburg, Germany. He came across illustrations of Clodney sound figures that bore a striking resemblance to a tortoise shell. Die, das war das Überraschende für mich, sehr enge Verwandtschaft haben mit Strukturen in der Natur und besonders hier mit dem Schildkrötenpanzer. Clodney figures are named after Ernst Clodney, an 18th century musician and physicist. He spread sand on metal plates and played them with a violin bow. The vibrations from the bow caused the sand to gather into beautiful geometric forms. Next, Alexander discovered the research of Hans Jenny, a Swiss physician who took up and expanded on Clodney's work in the 1960s using fluid mediums and electronic amplification of sound. Yeni coined the term cymatics from the Greek for wave for this branch of study. Today, Alexander Lauterwasser is building on the work of his predecessors, employing modern sound and recording equipment. He has custom built devices which allow him to stimulate various materials, such as sand or water, with sound vibrations whose frequencies can be precisely controlled. Um das Ganze auch dokumentieren zu können und festhalten zu können, wird es hier mit einer Videokamera gefilmt. Wenn das alles richtig eingerichtet ist, gehe ich an den Frequenzgenerator, beginne mit einer relativ tiefen Frequenz.
The sand is pushed from areas where the vibration is strongest and collects where it is the weakest, forming patterns that correspond to the particular tone that is applied to the plate. The higher the frequency applied, the more complex and detailed is the pattern that results. Under controlled conditions, these forms are repeatable. So now I go to the work of Masaru Emoto. Masaru Emoto was a Japanese, because uh, he died three years ago, that because of his bad English, when he, he wanted to buy a water machine, not to heal, but when he got connected to the United States and ordered his machine for the company, what he got was a healing machine that you could uh, put add frequencies to the water to help heal the people. But then he started uh, working with the machine and the company, besides after ordering the other one, <laughs> and he realized that people don't really have so much faith unless they have something visual to prove that something is happening. So how could he show people that emotions Affect, affect you and you become ill, how, how he could show people that thoughts could make you sick, and how he could show people that music could help you heal and has such a great impact in the human being. So he was uh, trying to, to see how he could create photographs of that so that he could help people see that. And then he saw crystals, este, copos de nieve, snowflakes and a window. And then he decided to freeze water and take pictures of it. So he would, uh, he would put speakers between the water he was uh, going to take photographs of and have that energy into the water and then he would photograph. He would have people praying and he would take photographs. And he would have thoughts, people sending thoughts good or bad and then he would take photographs. And these are the results. Uh, this is the water before uh, people praying in it. And this is the results after people, the samples after people pray on it. And there's a big difference. And this is music applied to water. This is uh, classical music and heavy metal, which affects the water, and the, the important thing is that if we think that we're 70% water and the brain is 85 to 90% water, this is what happens to us when we're ex experiencing and hearing that kind of music. And now I'm going to show you how, uh, because Emoto's work is related to water, how sound affects water. A cat for Susan. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and then it's getting more interesting. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it goes up and down.
And you could see how the, the different wave frequencies affects the, the wave that is formed. <laughs> the what? Oh. Uh huh. Yes. So now you could see it really affecting water, how sound. So let me go this side. Sound is, affects matter, and it affects a levitation. And we're going to see how sound makes objects levitate in another uh, video. It can destroy matter, because that you, you have it in medicine, that you can uh, destroy uh, stones in your kidney. And now they're in, in, um, in uh, Israel, they're destroying brain tumors with sound. They, they haven't brought that technology because it has not been approved in the United States, but I have a TED talk which you could see the physician talking about how you can destroy things with sound. But we also know that the, in the Bible they say that the Jericho uh, walls fell down, and it was about resonance, how you get into the same frequencies and you can destroy it, like the bridge that the soldiers were marching and it destroyed the bridge. So it can levitate objects, it can destroy objects, and it can extinguish fires. And I didn't know about that one. And it is amazing that this has been, a, this experience has been going a many years ago, and why don't we use that in forest fires? So it's a thing that really struck me. And uh, what is the other one I have there? Bo ah, it boils water. We have somebody from Australia or New Zealand that uses a sound to boil water. And like they use the laser with light, now there's called Saser technology, where they use sound uh, to get frequencies into a certain spot. So in living organism, that's in matter, in plants, animals, uh, and what is the other one there? And in humans, <laughs> you can see it affects our emotions, and we know that about music. When you hear a sad music, you become sad, and when you be a happy music, not only you become happy, your body moves in a happy way, and a nice word, can make your day, and uh, somebody, you know, a bad word, bad is not the word, it, uh, something negative words can do all the contrary. So it affects healing. We know that sound affects healing by the work we do here through binaural beats, but also through music. We know there's, and tasone, uh, uh, crystal bowls that go to a certain frequency and they help you heal, and there's many other instruments that have been developed to do sound healing. And it affects the cognitive function. Uh, if you put hemi-sync CDs, you could do photo reading much better, and you kids that have problems reading, because I work with that, using sound, you get other kinds of effects. I have said, I have had kids that have said, is this magic? I, I can't believe I'm reading so fast. So it affects our cognitive functions. Aristoteles and uh, Plato used to say that music has such a great impact on the whole human being that you have to be very careful with the music you play. And Chinese emperors would pick the music that was played in their reigns, also in their, in their in their place 
They, they were not, you were not allowed to put any kind of music. And music reflects the feeling of the ages. In Puerto Rico, nowadays, there's reggaeton, which I like and don't like because the music, you, for dancing it's good because it has a great rhythm, but the lyrics are very violent. And when you have a music that has violence in, the, in what they talk, it creates violence in society, like rap music in the States. And so uh, music has a great impact and also in the spiritual development. Music has been used in uh, churches and in, in the bowls. They have certain frequencies that will elevate your spirit. And here at Monroe, to get uh, spiritual experiences, we use Sam and we use Hemising, certain frequencies that get your brain into delta or gamma states. So this is the fire uh, experiment that has been done. The members of Sori Sound Engineering Research Institute at Sungzhi University set a fire in a bowl using paint thinner fluid. As soon as they bring the sound wind fire extinguisher close to the flame, the fire goes out. The device does not use any water or chemical fluids like a conventional fire extinguisher, but just sound and wind. In 2012, the United States National Institute of Science announced that a fire can be put out by surrounding it with two large sound speakers. This verified the possibility of a fire extinguisher utilizing sound. How does it work? When the sound extinguisher produces low frequency sound of 100 Hz, its vibration energy touches the flame, scatters its membrane, and then blocks the influx of oxygen, so the flame goes down. Earlier this year, a couple of American graduate students introduced a portable sound extinguisher and demonstrated it on YouTube, but it was too heavy and too weak. The Sori Sound Engineering Research Team introduced an improved device, a sound wind extinguisher, by installing a sound lens and speaker to produce a more focused power of sound, 10 times stronger in its power than the previous one. This sound wind extinguisher is very light, weighing only 1.5 kilograms, and can be carried around with one hand. It is also small in size, measuring 40 centimeters in length. With an easy on and off switch, you can use it anywhere up to 1 to 2 meters distance from the flame. When the sound touches the flame, it shakes its atomic structure, lowers its temperature by blocking oxygen away from the flame, and eventually puts out the fire. But if you use the sound in a usual way with a normal speaker, it scatters into the air without any effect on the flame. We invented the device to focus the sound using a lens, resulting in power 10 times stronger. Professor Pam Young Jin, the director of the Sori Sound Engineering Research Institute, believes that the sound wind extinguisher is fit best for the beginning stage of a fire. It can be used at So you can see how sound affects fire. And then sound eh, affects levitation. And there's videos of, of uh, Tibetan monks putting uh, their longhorns in different positions and how could they even levitate a big boulder. And here we're going to see it, uh, how it levitates particles. And this person, Ed, you can read the name, because <laughs> I don't have my, eye, my glasses. And I went to this castle in Florida, and the castle is built with these big blocks of coral stones, and the guy built the whole thing by himself. And they were said that he used sound to levitate the stones and cut them, and, how, and that's how it was created. So uh, that's a good place to, to go ahead to verify that. But I went there, and that's what they say there. So it's a very interesting thing.
This person, Peter Davis from New Zealand, he's the one that uh, uses water to uh, sound to boil water. But he wanted to sell his work, and so he died, and nobody really knows how he. The research is not out there. So, and that's a magnetron of resonance, and there's so many artifacts. And this is the Sacer technology, but I'm not going to put any more videos. And so sound is used in healing, uh, some ex uh, examples. We use hemisync in healing, and we use SAM in healing, because Bob has done experiments with uh, SAM in, uh, in uh, the persons that come from the war with uh, post-traumatic syndrome. And a Moto had a Hado scan where you, you would put your hand in, a, in an apparatus, and the sound that every uh, organ in your body emits, when it's healthy, it sounds like a beautiful orchestra. But when it's not healthy, it sounds very bad. So what he would do is go to different areas of your body to see if your organ was in, in uh, accordance, in resonance with what should be healthy. And if it was not, and then he would calibrate water with that information to help you heal. So there's root frequency, sound healing, all these kinds, tuning fork treatments. I once had a massage where the person would put a tuning fork in my, in my um, shoulders because I get my stress comes into my shoulder and it will dissolve. And it was amazing crystal bowl massage, and ultrasound, all those uh, sound in healing. And, and there's much more than what I have there. So why is sound so important to the body? The first, uh, the first, como se dice, oh, the first sense to fully develop in yourself is the sound of healing at 18 weeks in, in embryo. And there's all people that, and the last uh, sense to be lost. So if it's the first to be formed and the last to be lost, it must have some significance. Also, I always, there's, there's another theory that as soon as the heart starts beating, the vestibular system starts forming and I always wonder if, if the baby is formed, all the organs are formed because the baby is hearing all the sounds from his mother. And through sound in water, the embryo grows. And that's how it's replicated. I always wonder about that. The, audi the auditory nerve has connections to all parts of the body, to the heart, uh, through the vagus system, it goes uh, to the heart connection. To the thymus, it affects your immune system. And it is connected to all the, the nerves in your brain. And let me see if I missed something. What is it about the each ear processes different information? Ah, this is very interesting. Because each, thank you for asking, each ear is connected to one hemisphere. So your right ear, which is connected to your left brain, is more into a speech, while the left ear, which is connected to your right brain, is more until the, the tone you have, the melody in your voice. So they're processed in different ways, which is I find very interesting also. Can, sorry, can you repeat that? I, I don't know. Okay. The right uh, ear is connected to your left side of the brain. So therefore, it, it, uh, what you talk uh, and rhythm goes to your left ear. And melody and tones, the, to the left ear is melody and tone because it's connected to the right side of the brain. So they, their process is sound different. And? What if speech was melodic? Huh? What if speech was melodic? <laughs> That's why you need both, yeah, yes, yes. 
That's why the importance of synchronizing the brain, which can be done through sound. When, when you start studying, when I started working with uh, autistic kids, and, and, I, and I thank God for all the research that has been done in the Institute that I could help autistic kids. It was, they become so sensitive to sound that uh, when you put the hemi-sync like Cloudscape and Masterworks, it would do wonders because it would relax them. One of the mothers of, of the, because I, rec I recommended Cloudscape for sleep in, in autistic kids. And the results were amazing. I had kids that, that they were not uh, speaking. And after sleeping with hemisync, they would start saying words. Kids that spoke very few words after having, using a sleep tape, which I, I usually recommended Cloudscape. One of the mothers says, for the first time in my life, my kid always lives in a, like a fetus position, fetal, fetus, fetus position. And after hearing Cloudscape for the first time, he opened his arms out. And if you relax yourself, then all the connections, that's what I think, all the connections that were in the brain that didn't, weren't strengthened, if you sleep better, they would start to consolidate. So the information was there, but if you relax, it comes forward. So a relaxation and sound in getting you into this relaxed state, which I think what Hemisync does is to relax you. And if you relax, you're more open to learning, you're open to healing, you're open to everything. And sound is vibration and and when and other things that I have thought about sound, when you start to vibrate something, in and you have a many times you you get sick in your body because a, bad things a, like in the bloodstream, a, things sediment themselves, and if you use vibration, sound vibration, I guess you can clean your veins because they're vibrating and the the matters that are, that are not important they fall out. So I think that's one of the reasons I have thought that it could help so much in healing. Toning and chanting. And toning your voice, and I have Nini, where are you? Because she's gonna help me do an exercise on toning. How the tone of your voice can help you heal and you can learn which is the tone you have that is effective. Okay. <laughs> Tony, no con la voz de Dore, okay? U, uh, okay. Okay, so the sounds, we're gonna go from, it's U, O, A, E, I. So we go like in the notes, like do, re, mi. So we go, U, O, A, E, I. Okay, so first let's start with the bottom one. That's you want them to stand up and make it Yes, it's, it's better. Think of yourself as you're a reed, a flute. So your body, it's like a, like a reed. So we're going to play like five notes. So close your eyes, breathe in, take a deep breath, and we're going to do the ooh. Breathe in. Ooh. Take a break, take a breathe, relax, and the next one we're going to do the O, oh, you know, that one like the OM, um, that part of your body, which is the, the middle part. Breathe in. Oh. Take a break, take a deep breath, and now we're going to go to the heart, which is the A. And that one we're going to jam, not just go A, so you can go ah, 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 oh. Whatever you want. <laughs> okay, so let's breathe in. 
Let's take one more deep breath. And we're going to go to the E. The E is the, the intuition. It's that space that you have between your eyes. And it's going to be in a higher note like E. Okay, so let's breathe in. And let's take it from there. E. So let's, this one is your connection with the divine. This is the one that finishes up. Think of like you're being pulled up from, from the top of your head all the way up. So it doesn't matter if you go, but let's, <laughs> let's just pull all that air in coming out like, ee! so let's breathe in, take a, a deep breath, relax it. We're going the next one, breathe in. That is beautiful. So we have one more. We have one more. And this is the secret. Anytime that you are stressed and you feel that you need to unplug, so we're going to do all of them like do, re, mi, fa, sol. We'll go U, O, A, E, I. So it would be something like U, O, A, E, I. OK? So close your eyes. This is unplugging. So let's breathe in. U, take a singing bowl and you pass it through all your chakras, vortices of energy, when you strike the, the singing bowl, whatever area you need to work on, the vibration lowers itself. So it's a very interesting way of finding out what area you need to work. So we can diagnose this in a way uh, through sound, but if uh, one, when we develop the power of observation or, or, or of hearing, you know that by the tone of the voice, you know if a person is lying to you, you know if a person uh, is sad, you know if a person is very excited or happy, because the way you speak tells a lot of information. That's why many people, when they're angry, they prefer to text. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, when you're texting, the one that's receiving the message, even though you don't want to show your anger, if you want to hide your anger, you can text. And the information is out there. And one of the things I tell kids, that learning is so related to sound that Writing is the codification of words. So when kids are having trouble writing, I like to tell to them, look, think of yourself as a spy, and you're decoding what you're talking. And then it becomes interesting. So uh, seeing the words there, they, it, become, it has another meaning. So toning and chanting has proven that they have a lot of benefits that they're there. And obviously, the word is so powerful, which is sound, that what you say many times, be aware of what you say because it might become a reality. There's a lot of truth up there. 
because your voice, you have a thought, and as, you say, as soon as you say it, it has more intention and more power. And writing it also has power because it's all about sound, but encoded. Uh, you could see a, a person toning, how the energy field changes. And uh, there's many pictures in the internet that I, I, I'm gonna send you como a list of things where you can see how in the Kirlian uh, camera you can realize the impact of sound in your body and in plants and in everything. What I, I really wanted to express in my talk is why Monroe picked sound. I don't think it was by chance. I don't think that the work he did in sound was a, because he was a sound engineering, because I think it is something more deeper than that, because sound is in the middle of creation. And the work that we do here is so excellent because it's about creating, about creating happiness, about creating a, explore about cre creating a knowledge to know that you're more than your physical body. And that's why I think we use sound. That's my perception. So uh, that's the huddle that I spoke about. And this, Sergei spoke about this, how vibration can heal all uh, illness. These two people worked on that. And this guy has a, uh, a TED presentation, how with sound you could kill uh, cancer cells. All of this, I'm going to give them in the slides because I, everything that I use is gonna be given to you so you can explore it. And music. Music is a universal language. I think music makes, people spend so much money in when they make a film in the music they pick because everybody remembers Jaws by boom, 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 and then you get nervous. And, and if you take the music out of a, a scary film, it doesn't make you scared at all. So music has a great impact on emotions. And it is the universal language because no matter where you go, you can enjoy the music of whatever culture it is. And music sound in the brain, the power of music and mind control, mind control by ryth rhythmic sounds. And Rhythm affects you so much, especially I'm, I'm from Puerto Rico and we're Latins. You could, in a shopping center, you go and people are walking and suddenly there's music and then they go like, and then they continue walking. So it affects your body totally and it affects your brain and it affects your emotions. And there's so much research on music, how it affects healing, and, and why? I, because it's sound, a beautif beautiful sound and beauty affects us all because it's, a, it's organized sound when it's organized. So it like, helps us organize our thoughts, helps us organize the, our organs and everything. And those are different frequencies that have different uh, brain states and and we know that sound uh, in an EEG you can see how sound affects brain waves and how you can go into delta states and on all the things that are related to that state so sound plays a very important part in how to learn and how to use your brain more effectively and the brain is not the mind or the soul so the brain is the receptor that is taking all the information and processing it. So that information, it, it says how sound, color, all the senses are organized. And uh, what does the research shows? That music is very important and I will give you all that data. And here you could say how, how it's a holographic principle with music. And then we all know this, so I'm gonna scan through it, how, 
how the binaural beats affect the brain and then did you create different states with it? And obviously Hemisync and Sam and how we're advancing with these two technologies in the, in the institute. And there you could see the benefits of Hemisync which we that are here know all about it. And like Stefano was doing uh, in Italy with a, como es que se llama, a hospices. We have a many research that is, has been done by other uh, people that have done research for the professional division. And there was one research that they, many years they taught here, how a person that had a, a schizophrenia, how it was affected so positively with the use of music. Meta music and Barbara Bullard has expanded this as Suzanne and many other researchers here. So, <laughs> so what are we doing in the institute with all the knowledge that I expect? Uh, with, with all the knowledge about sound, we use sound frequencies, and when you do a hemisync exercise, you see you also use waves, the sounds of the ocean, and then reason tuning. That way you balance all the energies in your chakra. And then you have a voice, which is sound, that is gonna guide you and it's going to relax you. And then we go into a hypnagogic state with Bob's voice and other trainers' voice. And then we use visualization and image through sound because we're guided, we're giving guided images. And then I remember there was a um, video the video, no, an audio done by Bob and Skip, how they did reverse engineering in the Institute in the 80s. And how Hemisync was created and it is used and Sam. So I think Bob work and our work as trainers when we go to the world is so related to sound and how we can impact the world to be happy and the work we do to exploration of consciousness, it is through sound. And as a trainer, when I go to the world, like I, I was explaining, it is sound that you can show to people and they're not gonna go like, this is woo. It's because there's so much research about that. So that's it. Yeah.